it's, it's, always, it's always a pleasure for me to talk about women and um, actually it was great listening to Max talk about those brilliant women because they are honestly. And as you rightly said, there's so many that we still don't know about. Um, and again, I would argue as well that they weren't um, written out, they were just very much underestimated. Some people did write out the history, but um, a lot of their comrades, they always could include the story of the women and local historians around the country never sort of separated the women into a women's category. They did include the women's story. But um, I am absolutely thrilled to be talking about this woman, Kathleen Clark. Um, tomorrow is the 50th anniversary of our death. And um, she's just amazing. Didn't hold back. Um, so I suppose this talk is my trip <coughs> to war. And if you haven't or don't know anything about Kathleen Clark, uh, you will know more about her tonight. So uh, I suppose to go back to the very beginning and similar to what Max had said, the, the role of the family is so important in that generation, in the development of the political outlook and the thoughts of that generation. And um, education is very important to that education. And we can't underestimate um, the, the importance of oral history, of the stories around the fireside, because their parents were the generation that had either been born or were the first generation after the famine. So those stories, those songs are so important in inspiring that generation who will stand up and make a difference. Um, but looking at Kathleen's direct family, we have three big influences on her life. Um, our mother, Catherine O'Mara, was a businesswoman, just like Kathleen was. Um, our father Edward Daly and our uncle John Daly, who they themselves were involved in the Fenian movement. So Kathleen and the whole uh, Daly family, they have that connection, that Republican um, lineage going back through um, her dad and our uncle. And our, our dad, or sorry, our uncle John Daly will feature in the story later on. And we have Catherine O'Mara and Edward Daly, they do get married and they have nine children. Here are the Daly children. And you can see a whole big gang of girls, God love them, and one boy. Um, but who have we got? In the back row we've got Nora, she was born in 1889. Annie Beside her, she's 1886. Agnes, 1879. Carrie was born in 1884. Laura, 1882. And in the front row we've got Eileen, 1875. Kathleen Beside her, she's 1878. Uh, Madge, 1877. And then Ned. The baby of the family, the only boy born in 1891. But tragically, who he's named after, his father, he never got to actually meet him because his father, Kathleen's dad, did die um, shortly before Ned was born. But that, um, that obviously, that, um, that tragedy, the death of their father, had a big impact on the family because there is the breadwinner, there is the father figure gone from the family. And um, like a lot of families at that time, we see that after 1916 rising with the imprisonments and the rape and so on, um, a lot of people were left destitute because they had no income support with the breadwinner being gone. And um, luckily enough for the Daly family, um, you have Edward's brother James stepping in to, to keep the family going, to keep them afloat, and he does very well. But where was John at this point? Where was their uncle at this point? Well, in 1891, he was actually serving a prison sentence in England because he had been involved in the dynamite campaign, which was the Vena dynamite campaign in England. We've got Tom Clark being involved and many others, where they actually bombed key targets around England. Now, they were sentenced to life imprisonment, and the guards <coughs> in the prisons were actually ordered to destroy these men, if not physically, then mentally. And you have John Daly who swore Tom Clark into the IRB. He is there in the prisons with Tom Clark to become great friends. Um, and it is true her uncle that Kathleen becomes aware of Tom Clark who will play a huge role in our life. But um, that bomb campaign took part in the 1880s um, and John Daly is released early from prison because you have the amnesty campaign that is launched to release the men. Now, it takes a long time for them all to be released, certainly. You have John Daly being released in 1898, Tom Clark, it's another couple of years. 
But people who were involved in that campaign included people like Maud Gaughan, women who were would themselves go on to play a huge role in the Republican <coughs> movement. Now, when John Daly was released, he goes back to Limerick because the Daly's were from Limerick and he comes home to a hero's welcome. And you can see how much regard he was, he was or how much esteem he was held in by his community because you can see that he's a member or elected a member of the Limerick Council in 1899, a position he holds until 1906. And he actually is the mayor of Limerick between 1899 and 1902. So John Daly, although a convicted criminal in the eyes of the government, the people of his hometown, they hold him in such high regard and this is what they think of him, that he becomes their mayor um, of Limerick. Now when he was released, sorry it's 1896 that he was released, he sets up the bakery um, because the family, although it's due business people, um, they, they need some actual business to, to be set up and John sets up the bakery and he has the nieces and the family working in the bakery with him and here we have um, a photograph of the bakery which was a very successful business but there's one niece that refused to work in the bakery and I bet you can guess who it was, it was Kathleen. Um, and the thing is that although she adored her uncle John Daly, it seems that the two of them were, were very similar in personality and um, it seems that they would have clashed quite often and um, so she refused to actually go into the family business of the bakery. Instead she follows in her mother's footsteps and she was a seamstress just like her mother and she sets up her own very successful business and we have her in 1901 that she was the manager of a dressmaking firm in Limerick. So Kathleen is going out on her own and I do believe having read her book um, or biography written by our niece or I suppose edited by our niece Helen Lynn um, and other stories or, or information that was passed down to other people Kathleen Clark is a very independent spirit she was always going to do something whether it was in politics whether it was in business and you can see here very early on she is going out on her own not afraid to go out on her own in the world of business but then she meets the man who changes her life completely and it is this man Tom Clark when he was released from prison in 1899. Now when her uncle John is released from prison and she talks about this in her book um, he is full of stories about this man Tom Clark um, and here we have a photograph of a young Tom Clark before he was sent to prison and she is become so enamored with him and you can imagine because the descriptions the way she says it in her book you can see that she is picturing this Adonis, this Republican Adonis, and she can't wait for the time that she will get this chance to meet him. Um, and she does get to meet him because one of the first places to go is when he is released is to Limerick to see John Daly and his family. Um, Kathleen is sorely disappointed when she first meets Tom Clark, and I leave it to her words to uh, describe it. And what she says is, it was my first time meeting him. I was keenly disappointed. His appearance gave no indication of the kingly, heroic qualities which Uncle John had told us about. There was none of the conquering hero which I envisioned. He was emaciated and stooped from the long imprisonment and hardship. As I came to know him, his appearance receded into the background and the man Uncle John had portrayed was revealed. Mm -hmm. By the time he left Limerick to join his mother and sister in Kilmainham, we had become intimate enough to agree to correspond with each other. So you can see that the real Tom Clark is revealed. She does fall in love with him. And although her uncle Tom or John Daly adored Tom Clark, he did not want Kathleen to be involved with him because she he knew that if they did become an item, if they did get married, they would not live out their lives together. Um, but Kathleen, being an independent spirit, she was going to do her own thing and she ignores her uncle's protests and in 1901, the two of them got married in New York. Um, John McBride, who was involved in the East Horizon alongside Tom Clark, was the best man at the wedding. So they got married on the 16th of July in New York. 
um, and a four son, John Daly Clark. He was born in Greenpoint, uh, Brooklyn, in 1902. And again, Kathleen turned my hand to business, ran a very successful ice cream parlor. Tom was involved with Clan of Gale over there because they were the ones that had funded the, the, the Fenian Dynamite campaign. So Tom does have connections with people in America. He's involved in a newspaper that he wrote as well. Um, by 1906, they're in Manorville, Long Island, and they set up a market garden. So you can see that they're setting a life up. Kathleen is setting a life up for them over in America. And while Tom is involved in that life, he always has one eye back in Ireland, what is happening in Ireland. And around 1906, you have three young men that are injecting this new blood into the IRB, the organisation that he was a member of. Men like Sean Dermida, Omar Hobson, and Dennis McCullough, who wanted to basically bring the organisation back to the organisation that it was in the days of Tom Clark, because at this point it was full of old men, it was a talking shop, and a lot of them were in pubs, they were main, probably alcoholics. Dennis McCullough actually barred his own father, expelled his own father from the organisation. And what Tom Clark sees in these three men, especially Sean McDermott, is younger versions of himself. And he begs Kathleen to come back to Ireland. Now, she knew that if they did come back to Ireland, that was it. They would not live out their days together. But she also knew she could not keep him in America. Um, so reluctantly, she agrees to come back. They come back. And when Sean McDermott and Tom Clark meet, 1907, 1908, that is the seeds being sown for the Easter Rising that will take place in 1916. But again, Kathleen, she's not one to be idle. You can see another two children follow suit. We've got uh, Tom is born in 1908. Her son Emmett is born in 1909. And she and Tom, they set up another business. They have news agents. The first one is set up in Amiens Street. Um, and then we have the famous news agents, tobacconists, that was set up then at the top of Parnell Street, at the corner of Parnell and O'Connell Street. And we see Tom Clark standing outside that shop there, which became a hub for um, the volunteers or people who would become involved in the volunteers in the Irish Republican Army, in the IRA. Um, and here we have the two key men, um, highly regarded and adored, certainly Sean McDear with the boy, um, Tom Clark and Kathleen and Bulmer Hobson. But the thing about Tom Clark was that if you crossed him, that was it. And unfortunately, Bulmer Hobson was to suffer the wrath of Tom Clark at a later stage. But what was Kathleen doing, apart from having kids and running news agents, um, while her husband is busy plotting away and reorganising the IRB, well, she was keeping busy herself because she herself was a political activist. Um, you have the, the formation of the Irish Volunteers in 1913 alongside um, the formation of the Irish Citizen Army. And then we have the formation of Coming Them On in April 1914. And Kathleen is right there in the thick of it. She's a member of the central branch of Coming Them On, the main branch on the north side of the city, the grave, um, Hard Grave branch. Uh, she's a founding member of it, and she later becomes the president of the central branch. Um, the Irish Freedom newspaper, she helps to run it. And she's one of the few women um, that actually knows of the plans of the rise. Now this photograph, it's a brilliant photograph taken in complete secret. Um, this was won for coming them on. Now it's from 1920, it was the executive um, meeting that was held. It had been prescribed in 1920, so the Carmelites in Whitefriar Street Church, um, they gave coming them on permission to use the, the room at the back of the church, so the women, to sort of not bring any attention to themselves, they went to mass. Um, and just walk straight through and went into the back room. And here you have the elite of coming them on. So there you have Kathleen Stairfield alongside Countess Markovich, Mrs. Pierce is there, you've got Eilish Nibreen there. It's literally a who's who um, of coming them on. But there she is, a member of the executive. You can see how important Kathleen Clark is um, in coming them on. So then we come to 1916, and Kathleen has said she was aware of the plans, Tom tells her of the plans. And she had wanted to be with Tom, fight in Easter week. Um, but Tom had another job for Kathleen to do, and that was to keep everything going, because he knew that the leadership of the volunteers of the IRB, which included the seven signatures of the proclamation, it would be wiped out. But Tom's big gamble, and it, it proved to be true, 
1916 would be the spark that would ignite the flame of revolution. It wasn't going to be another 1798 or an 1848. 1916 would be that spark that would ignite that flame of revolution. And someone needs to be there to be the link. Someone needs to be there to reorganise. That was Kathleen's job. Um, now, Thomas, of course, in the GPO 1916, he is the first to sign the proclamation. Um, there are stories or there is accounts of him in the witness statements where he is watching Pierce read now the proclamation. And I suppose this becomes a bone of contention for Kathleen later on because Pierce is seen as the face of the rise and it is the post rebellion. It's McDonough, it's Plunkett, they're the people, they're the names. And the reason that she does write her book is to put Tom's role in the rising back at centre stage. But the thing about Tom Clark is, he is the puppet master of 1916, but he had to be invisible because he was only released on license. So if he was seen to be doing anything, they could whip him back into prison. So he is quite happy to see Pierce. He is the one that got Pierce in that position. Another great thing about Tom Clark is, he knew what people he needed to use to get the job done. Pierce the great speaker, get him once he passed Tom's test, that's him, that's done. And um, he is the puppet master behind everything. But he is in uh, GPO alongside Sean McDermott. Um, and you can see here the GPO, it was completely destroyed. When Kathleen or Tom leaves to say goodbye to Kathleen um, on Easter weekend, that was it. She thought she would never see him again. Tom would go down in a hail of bullets, he would go down fighting because he could not endure another day in prison of what they had done to him for the 15 and a half years that he was in prison. Um, and actually in 1922, Kathleen published his book, Glimpses of an Irish Felon's Prison Life. It has been reprinted by the Sinn Féin shop. If you haven't read it, read it, because that is where you see how Tom or Kathleen Clark fell in love with Tom. It's an amazing, amazing testimony. But knowing what Tom had endured, she is expecting that as the last time I'll see him, that is it. Um, Tom, like the others, um, they go to uh, Moore Street and they end up surrendering. Tom did not want to surrender. Um, however, you have that moment in Moore Street where the family are shot. Pierce witnesses it and he realises then they're going to kill everyone to get to them. They have to surrender. And Tom is in the street is, um, in the grounds of Rotunda by um, Lee Wilson, who himself is later shot on the orders of Collins um, at the start of during the War of Independence. But um, what about Kathleen? Um, she herself is arrested in the roundups that happen after the rising. Um, she is literally wrenched from her young children who are only six, seven, eight years of age. And she is taken to Ship Street Barracks where she gets this letter from Tom. Um, which I suppose it would be a bit of a surprise because she was expecting that what she will hear of Tom is that he died. But I'm just gonna read out what he said to her. And this is from uh, Richard Barracks that he wrote it. And he says, I'm in better health and more satisfied than for many a day. All will be well eventually, but this is my goodbye. And now you are ever before me to cheer me. God bless you and the boys. Let them be proud to follow the same path. Sean is with me on McGarry. And um, all well. They're all heroes. I'm full of pride, my love. Yours, Tom. Love to John and Madge. So I suppose she sees this and this is the goodbye. Um, but of course, Tom is court-martialed. He is sentenced to death. And she gets another note that her husband wishes to see her because he is going to be executed in Comain in jail. Now, personally speaking, if that was me, um, and I would get another chance to see the love of my life, um, I would be delighted. Um, Kathleen, when she goes to Comain in jail, as Paul shown that it was a true marriage, um, she starts to give out to him. She starts to say, you told me you weren't going to surrender. So they're having like this sort of marital, marital spat um, while he's hours away from execution. But um, he tries to explain to her if he didn't want to surrender, if it have made him surrender, but there you have a true marriage within that cell in Comain and Jail. On the 3rd of May, Tom Clark is among that first group of three that are executed and is followed on the 4th of May. Now it's not bad enough that Kathleen says goodbye to her husband on the eve um, of his execution. She is back in Comain and Jail the very next night 
because her brother, her baby brother, her only brother now, Daly, who was in charge of the garrison of the Four Courts, was only 25 years old, was also court martialed and sentenced to death. He was executed on the 4th of May. On top of that, Sean McDermott, the 12th of May, he and James Connolly are the last two to be executed. On the orders of General Maxwell, who threatened to resign if those two men were not executed. And his words were, James Connolly being the most evil man in Ireland, and Sean McDermott, the most dangerous man in Ireland. While she is dealing with all of that, one thing she did not tell Tom when she had those last few moments sitting in the cell was that she was expecting their fourth child. She couldn't do that to him because she felt if he knew it would weaken him. He was quite ready to go to his death, but if he knew, maybe he might try to get clemency so that in some way he might be with her. She could not do that to him. Um, shortly after the executions, she suffers another loss in that her uncle, who she adored, who adored Tom and Sean McDermott and Ned Daly, and um, he died. And then shortly after that, she lost um, her unborn child. So despite this massive tragedy that Kathleen herself has endured, she follows Tom's wishes and, wishes and she does exactly what he asked her to do. And the £3,000 in gold that he gave her, she uses that to set up the Republican Dependence Fund. Um, now, it was for Sorkin McMahon and John Joseph Reynolds, I think it was. And at the same time, you have the National Aid Fund that that was set up. And you had people involved in coming on, but very importantly with the National Aid, you had nationalist politicians. And they went to Kathleen and said, you know, look, we're doing the same thing. Why don't we amalgamate? And she went, not a hope, not a hope in hell because she did not trust them. And she holds out um, and she wins. Because what you have then is the Irish National Aid and Volunteer Dependence Fund. She had to drop the Republican. It was too sort of extreme, the language. But it is Kathleen that wins out. And here we have some of the women that are involved in the, uh, the collecting of the information, the distributing of the funds and so on. And all of these women that you see in that photograph had been out in 1916. Over half of them arrested and imprisoned in Kilmainham Jail. But they are the women that actually begin to fan the flames of revolution. And um, the propaganda war begins on the sword of May 1916, and it is true Kathleen Clark and the women of Cullen and Mon. Um, and it means that by the end of 1916, when the prisoners are released from Frondock, and then later in 1917, they come home as heroes. And it cannot be underestimated or overstated how important Kathleen Clark and the women were to that sea of change in public opinion. Now, we know, um, Max has said, it talked about the by-elections, the local elections and so on that happened. The rise of Sinn Féin happens very, very quickly and the British government are totally thrown by this. And we come to uh, the 1918 general election. Now, the war was still going on, but when the war would end, there would be a general election. You have the, the massive, another major mistake the British made with the threat of conscription in 1918 and it rallies moderates and it rallies republicans. Um, and Sinn Féin gets even bigger and bigger and bigger. And to try and combat this rise of Sinn Féin, you have a complete fabrication, which is the German plot, where the British say the, the Republicans are in cahoots, the Germans again, there's going to be another rise and let's stop it before it starts. Now, what Collins, who was on the rise, who had actually been in the National Aid and Volunteer Dependence Fund, he's a treasurer or a secretary, thanks to Kathleen Clark, she actually is responsible for getting Mike Collins in that position. Um, he was told there was a job going, she interviews him, and immediately she sees another Sean McDermott, a great charisma, great organiser. So Kathleen Clark is responsible for setting Mike Collins on his career because he is an ordinary rank and file volunteer in 1916, but it's thanks to Kathleen. Now, the intelligence network was building up. He gets word that the raids are going to come, they're going to try and arrest everyone connected with Sinn Féin. Some like um, Collins and Harry Gold and Cattle Brewer aren't in their homes that night, others like De Valera are. And there's a massive swoop. But caught up in that sweep are some women, including Kathleen Clark, Countess Markovic, and Maud Gaughan. Um, and they're all sent to prison in England. Now, in our book, when she talks about this, like one thing you see about Kathleen Clark, she doesn't hold her tongue, she cannot keep quiet. Um, and poor Countess Markovic keeps 
get and get an ounce of fire because she's coming into the cell and she's flicking her cigarette ash down all over the place so she's getting barred by Kathleen from her cell and they're annoying her and again she is wrenched from her children and through this period she her health is suffering massively she is stressed out all the time because she's trying to get word where are her children are they in Dublin are they with her family so it's all this stress building and building and building but she does hold out. Now eventually, um, she was released um, in 1919 due to her, and you can see from this photograph, um, this is the homecoming that was put on for Kathleen um, after her release from prison. And you can see that prison and the last couple of years have taken their toll on her, but despite the fact that her health has suffered, she has a job to do and she will do that job. So then we come to the War of Independence and again, she is very, very busy. Now, in the 1918 election, Kathleen thought that she would be put forward as a Sinn Féin candidate. And this, I think, is where one of the part places where Sinn Féin really did let the side down. They should have put more women forward as candidates. Um, Markovich and uh, Winifred Kearney are the only two. Um, and it's not like they should have put women, you know, like Mrs. Pierce and Kathleen Clark out there just because they're connected with the leaders of 1916, their widows, their mothers. Um, these women, as Kathleen had proved, were well able to organise and they were well capable of getting the job done. But um, she was overlooked for a man. Now eventually she is put forward and she does uh, become elected in, um, in 1921, sorry, in, yeah, 1921. But you can see what she's doing. She's elected to Dublin Corporation. She represents the Wood Key and Mount Joy Wards. So you have a lot of women being elected or appointed to the, the, uh, the local boards, the rural district boards and so on. The 1920s election, Sinn Féin, they, they wipe the board clean there as well. So they've got control of the, the sort of the parliamentary side of it, but also where the real power is in local government. She's a founding member of the Irish White Cross in 1920, and in May 1921, she's elected to Dáil Éireas, so that is that, um, the general election that takes place there. And during this time of so many, our house is constantly raided, and we then have the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty, which she was opposed to, along with the other five women TDs that were in the Dáil at that time. Now, you have the, the, the split that follows the signing of the treaty, um, and she is involved in the many peace moves between the pro-treaty and anti-treaty side in trying to avoid the civil war, but ultimately it couldn't be avoided and the civil war broke out in June 1922. Um, and she lost her seat in that treaty election, like a lot of anti-treaty people. Um, and unfortunately, she is arrested and imprisoned in Kermaino Jail. Um, you have Brie Blinds Thornton, one of the few women to go pro treaty. She's the medical officer in charge of the women prisoners in Kermaino at the time. She herself had been a prisoner in 1916. And she talks about one of the lowest moments of her life was the night that Kathleen Clark comes into Kermaino Jail, or Mrs. Clark as she calls her, um, and how it made her feel that she was in charge of this woman who had done so much and sacrificed so much for the Republic. Now she wasn't held there for a long time, but it, you know, it's, it's still a tragedy that she herself was imprisoned. And here we've got four of the women um, who, of the TDs, who were opposed to the treaty. And as Max said earlier, um, Ada English, who is one of the only few people to actually talk about um, partition um, in the debates. Um, now here we have Kathleen, then we have Countess Margaret, we have Kate O'Callan, whose uh, husband was the former Lord Mayor of uh, Limerick, who had been more in front of her um, a, a couple of months before, um, towards the end of the War of Independence, and of course Mrs. Pierce, um, whose both sons were executed in 1916. And when it comes to treaty rates, and if you haven't looked at them, read them, they're all online, they're off to stop a year. Um, and it's heartbreaking to read them because you're literally seeing the relationship break down in front of you. Um, but when it comes to the debates and the, the, the discussions, and um, the women are blamed for an awful lot. Um, the women are seen to be emotional, the women are seen to be rattling the bones of the dead, they're seen to be irrational. Everyone was emotional at that time, man or woman, it didn't matter. But here's just a, a section um, of Kathleen's speech in the doll. 
and she's explaining quite clearly why she will not accept the treaty. Um, I'll just read out a little bit for you here. She says, um, what's it? The, hang on, it's, uh, we were told by one deputy um, on Monday with a stupendous bell that this treaty was a stupendous achievement. Well, if, it means, um, if he means as a measure of home rule, I will agree it is. It is the biggest home rule bill we have ever been offered and it gives us a novelty in the way of a new kind of official representing His Majesty King George V, name yet to be decided. If England is powerful enough to impose on us home rule, dominion or any other kind, let her do so, but in God's name do not accept or approve it no more than you would any other coercion act. I hear big, strong military men say here they would vote for this treaty, which necessarily means taking an oath of allegiance. And I tell those men there, there is not enough power or power enough to force me, nor eloquence enough to influence me in the whole British Empire into taking that oath. Though I am only a, a frail scrap of humanity, I took an oath to the Irish Republic solemnly, reverently, meaning every word. I shall never go back from that. So there's no mention of tongue there. Um, she is saying she took that oath to the Republic. Now she continues, like Deputy Duggan, I too can go back to 1916. So we have Eamon Duggan talking about 1916 and the leaders who died. So they brought up, she hasn't, and then she brings and mentions Tom. And she says, between 1 and 2 o'clock in the morning of May the 3rd, I, a prisoner in Dublin Castle, was roused from my rest on part of the floor and taken on a round escort to come in jail to see my husband for the last time. I saw him, not alone, but surrounded by British soldiers. He informed me he was not to be shot, or he was to be shot at dawn. Was he in despair like the man who spoke of him on Tuesday? Um, no, not he. His head was up, his eyes flashing, his years seemed to have slipped from him. Victory was in every line of him. Tell the Irish people, he said, that I and my comrades believe we have saved the soul of Ireland. We believe she will never lie down again until she has gained absolute freedom. And though sorrow was in my heart, I gloried in him, and I have gloried in the men who have carried on the fight since every one of them. I believe that even if they take a wrong turn now, they will be brave enough to turn back when they discover it. I have sorrow in my heart now, but I don't despair. I never shall. I still believe in them. So here we have Kathleen talking about her husband after someone else has spoken about her husband. So everyone was emotional when it came to the treaty debates. So Civil War ended in 1923. Um, and then what happens to Kathleen? Well, she is very, very active. She is still involved in politics, in political life. And um, here's what she does. In 1924, like a lot of anti-treaty women, she goes on the fundraising drives to America. Mrs. Pierce is there. There's many others that go to raise funds. Um, and it's for the Dependence Fund. In 1926, she becomes a founding member. She is one of the founding members of Philip Fall. Um, in 1926, she then also presided over the inaugural meeting um, of the National Graves Association. And then she's elected to the Dáil in 1927, but she lost her seat a year later. And then in 1928, she was elected to the Senate and she held that position until that was abolished um, in 1936. Um, and while she is in those positions of prominence of um, public office, um, she uses her position to speak out. And um, one thing about Kathleen Clark, if she saw an injustice, she spoke out about it. She couldn't help it. Um, and if she saw that people who were meant to be represented by the politicians were not being represented, were not, or their voice was not being heard, well, she was the one that was going to speak for them. So we've just got a few examples here. Um, we have this one in the middle, which is very important actually, it was the Norse and Midwives Pension Bill. And this was brought in for nurses and midwives who were attached to a hospital and they would get a pension. But as Kathleen raised the point, well, what about those nurses and midwives who weren't attached to a hospital, who were just within the community and who no one wants to have anything to do with because they were old now? Um, as she says in this section, like the women are being torn away by their patients because they're old. But these women were experts at their job, but yet were turfed down on the street pretty much. And she is speaking out. She is saying these women who have devoted their lives to their, their vocation um, should be um, looked after 
when they're, 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 when they retire. Um, there's a really interesting uh, letter here from him, and this is in relation to um, Arbor Hill. Now, Arbor Hill is where her husband and 1916 leaves were buried in that mass grave in the exercise yard in Arbor Hill Prison. And there were ceremonies and um, uh, commemorations at Arbor Hill, which she was always invited to. And here she states clearly why she will not go to Arbor Hill. And uh, just to read it out to you, she says, um, the release of the prisoners from Arbor Hill was a cause of this is in 1922, but um, this letter is from. And um, there was great rejoicing both the prisoners, their relatives and their friends. My heart went out to them in the rejoicings, but there was no cause of rejoicing for me. My husband and brother are both prisoners in Arbor Hill forever. There's, um, their ashes are there, prisoned in Eric, um, and there they shall remain with uh, their comrades until the last trumpet is sounded. I have never seen those graves, though invited to visit them each year by the Executive Council on the anniversary of their execution. I never intend to visit those graves on a pyramid from any source. Those graves belong to the relatives and the people of Ireland and should be thrown open to all. I suggest that the prison yard in which they're buried be thrown open to the people, that all the high walls surrounding be taken down and all the ground round Arbor Hill be turned into a memorial park, that the barracks itself be used as a centre of education, such as a national school of music on continental lines, a school which would lay or, or would foster national ideals and thought through the development of our national music, where the child with the vocation would be given a chance to develop his talent, no matter how poor his parents might be. In their own way, each of the men who lie there were educationalists, each having his own particular line, but all of one mind in their love for Ireland. Now that we have a Republican Party in power, this suggestion, I am sure, will not be ignored. And we sort of do see what happens to Arbor Hill later on. There is, um, I suppose, inspiration from what Kathleen has said there. Now, despite the fact that you have women being on that treaty divide, um, during the treaty debates um, in the Civil War, um, the women did come back very quickly from the split, especially when they're in the Senate together. And here we have Kathleen Clark going into the Senate with Mrs. Wise Power, who again, a family member coming among, a long political activist, but who had taken the pro treaty side during the Civil War. But when they see there's issues that, are, that they need to join forces together, they do that, they put politics to one side. And I suppose, I, when I saw this, it was like just in light of recent events, um, Kathleen Clark on the death of King George V. Um, and we have this, uh, this debate. Uh, there was an expression of sympathy. Uh, the Minister for Lands wants to move that Shannon Aaron expresses his deep sympathy with His Majesty King Edward VIII, with Her Majesty Queen Mary and the Royal Family and people of Great Britain on the death of His Majesty King George V. Um, and Kathleen Clark steps in with, uh, before you put that to the house, at the risk of being classified as ungracious, ungenerous and bitter, and that's a word that is used against Kathleen a lot, um, and all the other adjectives which may be words of me, I wish to be regarded as dissenting from this motion. And then, motion declared passed, all the members present, with the exception of Senator Mrs Clark rising in that place. And so she is not afraid to speak in. And that continues. We then have the conditions of employment bill. Now we know when Senate Fall got into power, and um, the the sort of the, the final nail in the coffin was being hammered in for women's rights and so on. But that started way back in 1924 with um, Kevin O'Higgins and so on, and it is sort of finalised with the, the constitution. But here we see there's many attempts where women are uniting and they're trying to, to stop that sort of undermining of women's rights and women in the workplace and so on. Um, and one of the things of the Conditional Employment Bill was that women were, were sort of taking the jobs of men. And Kathleen, again, just, just Google Kathleen or just search Kathleen Clark in the Oireachtas debates. She's just fantastic. Um, but here we have her asking um, particular questions and making particular statements about the Conditions of Employment Bill, in which she says, Another argument which Senator Farron used was that if this legislation was not passed, um, we would have men minding the babies and keeping the house while the women went out to work. And what she says, 
My answer to that is, if men could do that job as well and as successfully as women, I do not see why they shouldn't do it. It is most important work for the nation, though rather sneered at by men, because on that work depends what the individuals who will comprise the future nation are going to be. I do not think it would distract from their dignity in any way if they will do it as well as a woman. And then she continues because what she was saying is what jobs are you saying the women are taking from men? Answer that question. And she continues here where she says, um, in the, given the minister the power, I would ask him in a very limited fashion, um, the limitation I would put on this is that I would ask him to specify the industries out of which he is aiming to put women. I will be perfectly in agreement. I will put that up to the minister. If he said, I am going to prevent women from ever scrubbing floors, um, and I will make men do it instead. With that aim, I would be in absolute agreement because scrubbing floors is an ugly, hard, and badly paid job, and men do not want it. If he brings them a clause that will prevent women from scrubbing floors, I will be with him, of course. Um, that wasn't brought in. But you can see she is not afraid um, to speak her mind. And Deb, she is so critical of Deb, um, every chance she gets. Now, of course, Finna Fall come into power and the whole thing of dismantling the treaty so happily, like so many believe, that Deb Valera will get the Republic, the promise that he makes. Um, and she sees that he's not doing it quickly enough, he's not doing it when he should, um, and she calls him out on it. Um, but she is vilified in the newspapers um, because she basically calls him out in the open. And this was in response to a meeting that he attended in Geneva in the late 1940s. And what basically it's saying is, the 12th Annual Convention of the Finnefall Party, which was open in Dublin on Tuesday, was not such a tame affair. Business had not proceeded very far, when the president and his policy came in from for some severe criticism, Mrs. Tom Clark, foremost with of all support on an ardent Republican, told the meeting that she did not believe the country was being led towards the Republic. In fact, she said it would appear as if their leaders were slipping. She reproved the president for not getting rid of some of the country's uh, grievances by raising political points in Geneva and informing the League of the fact that Britain occupies our ports and has an interest in our main airbase. This criticism of the president and his chief supporters caused a great deal of excitement and in no small way embarrassed the politicians present at the convention. The remarks made by Mrs Clark were not entirely out of order or inaccurate and this fact was made, uh, made matters more difficult for the party leader. So she sees he's not living up to the promises that he uh, professed and she is letting them know. But as I said, she is vilified in the newspapers by her associates in Finna Fall. Now, here is a brilliant moment. Um, and actually, you have her colleagues <coughs> in the world trying to scupper this. Um, Kathleen had ran for the election of Lord Mayor many times. Um, but this particular time, in 1949, when she actually is appointed, it was on the vote of the outgoing Lord Mayor. People within her own party tried to block Kathleen from running or winning um, this election, but it backfired. And in 1949, she becomes Ireland's first woman um, Lord Mayor, and she served two terms. And the newspapers <coughs> full of accounts of uh, Kathleen's um, nomination. And what I love about this photograph, the chain that she's wearing. Um, it is not the Lord Mayor's chain, this is the one that she has specifically made because the Lord Mayor's chain was uh, given by King William of Orange and she refused to wear it so she had to get her own one made and Queen Nidali, when she was Lord Mayor, that was the chain that she wore. Um, and what does she do? Oh my God, she hits the ground running. The first thing she does is she redecorates the mansion house. She takes down all the portraits of the royals because she as a Republican could not have them looking down on her. And as this, again, it makes the newspapers, uh, Victoria goes. Um, and it's quite interesting um, just the way the newspaper reports it. Um, what we have here, Lord Mayor, not a servant of the Queen. The directions of the Lord Mayor, Mrs. Tom Clark, the large portrait of Queen Victoria, painted in 1849 by Carson Smith, was removed yesterday from the Hall of the Mansion House, Dublin. This picture of Victoria, which represents her as a young queen, has been removed to a safe place. Mrs. Clark, while she is Lord Mayor, will not allow the picture to be hung in the mansion house. She had it removed because she said Queen Victoria was one of the people who had a deep hatred of Ireland and the Irish people. Pictures of former lords and tenants in the parlour and other rooms will not be removed as the Lord Mayor considers that they were only the servants of their masters, the kings and governments of Ireland. 
But you can see here, there is sort of support and admiration for what she does because in this um, article, long overdue, removal of Queen Victoria's painting, when the Lord Mayor of Dublin, Mrs. Tom Clark, moved into the mansion house, Queen Victoria had to retire from the front hall to some less conspicuous position, says Seamus O'Farrell. The move was long overdue, he continues. History gives us little reason to revere the memory of Victoria, and if there could be any justification for allowing this life-size painting of her to hang for so long in the official residence of the four citizens of Dublin, it is that it enabled a woman um, to order its removal. We must wait now, I suppose, until a woman occupies the position of Taoiseach um, before the monument of Queen Victoria, which sits in Leinster Lawn, will cease to obstruct the path of our senators and deputies as they go to and from their labour. So you can see she's making an impact, not just in that sphere, but in her duties as the Lord Mayor. Again, she is using her position to highlight real issues that are affecting people. And she's in the newspaper, she is seen at the opening of everything, creches and schools and nurseries and so on. She really takes her role as Lord Mayor seriously. And then there's also her connection to the Republican movement because Kathleen never gave up on her Republican ideals, even though she may not have agreed with the Republican policy uh, at certain times, like in the 1920s with the bombing campaign in England, and um, because during the war she believed it was the wrong time to do that. Um, but she did not give up on her support for the Republican movement, and that is seen with the executions of Patrick McGrath and um, Thomas Hart in 1940. Um, now, Patrick Hart had been on hunger strike. She actually is involved um, in pleading for his release from prison, which he was released, and she visits him when he was released um, from prison. But then Patrick McGrath and Thomas Hart are arrested um, in a house in Rathgar, and there's a police officer killed, and these two men are tried by a military tribunal and are sentenced to death. Now, here is just a page from the petition for the reprieve of the sentences, and look at the address. It's the reprieve committee, Mansion House Dublin. So Kathleen actually gives over the Mansion House for the committee, not <coughs> for the reprieve of uh, Hart and McGrath, but also then for Tomás McCourton's son, who was also sentenced to death. She lent her support to the movement then. But she became disillusioned with Fianna Fáil with the Republican Party because she felt that it was not living up to the, the ideas in which it was set up on. And she resigned in 1943 and again made the newspapers, this the examiner from May 1943, in which it says, Mrs. Kathleen Clark, ex senator former Lord Mayor of Dublin and widow Tom Clark, executed 1916, has resigned from the Fianna Fáil Party, stating to a court examiner, representative and this is exactly she's not hiding why she resigned and um, that Fianna Fáil have not carried out the policy enunciated at the last general election. Mrs Clark said I thought from day to day that they would carry out their promises. I have given up that hope now. I am in perfect agreement with Fianna Fáil on one point only the tally. There is very little else in the policy with, with which I agree and it's understood that Mrs Clark's resignation was accepted and it was but she still remained active in political life she was still very much involved in the corporation work and she's still campaigning for people who don't have a voice and she lived with her son in serpentine uh, road and um, john daly and then she moved to liverpool and lived with her son ellis um, in 1965 and that is where she remained until she died tomorrow tomorrow 50 years ago um, and again, the newspapers were full of tributes. Um, Kathleen Clark's death, the, the impact and the sort of reverence and the admiration that there was for Kathleen Clark, it is seen in the papers. And we have a lovely tribute here that was in the press um, in October 1972. Um, and it reads, Mrs. Kathleen Clark has died and in her passing, one of the greatest women in Ireland has passed away from the political scene. Many years ago, I met her in Torlis and I discussed her the kind friendship that existed between herself and her husband up to the time he moved to the GPO to take his part in the rising. Her deep affection for him gives her a high place in Irish history among the greatest women 
of our time, Peace for Soul, and that was Patrick Joseph Ryan. And that is a fitting tribute. And she did get a fitting funeral um, for a woman who gave so much um, for the cause of Irish freedom, who sacrificed so much for the whole country. And here's just one of many photographs showing her funeral um, to Dean's Grange, where she is buried. And so there she is, Kathleen Clark. Um, if you haven't read Helen Linton's book, uh, the biography of her, and um, please do. This should be on every school books or schools reading list. It is just an amazing account. And in it, I say at this talk that she is the guardian of a flame. Kathleen Clark is not guarding one flame. She is guarding so many. As I've said before, she's the guardian of a bonfire because she was keeping Tom's memory alive. Ned's memory alive, Sean McDermott's memory alive, and um, those who hadn't a voice, the Republican ideal alive. She is keeping everything to the fore, despite what was going on in her own life. Um, she is truly, truly an amazing woman. She doesn't give herself enough credit in that book. It is all about Tom, it is all about Ned, but she sort of underplays her own role, and thank God that Helen actually printed this book, got this book published and added some notes in the back, biographical notes about Kathleen because although it's called Revolutionary Woman, she talks about the other revolutionaries in our life and it is my privilege today, 50 years on from her death, to just stand here and to be able to share this woman, this amazing revolutionary woman with you, Kathleen Clark. Council are commissioning a portrait, is that? Yeah, there, there's a portrait um, going in the city council chamber. Uh, it's actually been unveiled tomorrow. Now, because it's been unveiled in the ch actual chamber, it's, it's, it's limited. Um, I had actually proposed that at a later stage it should be shown in the downstairs in the rotunda of the city hall for the public. So hopefully that will happen at a later stage. But it is being unveiled tomorrow. It's the only, it'll be the only portrait, obviously, of a woman. Lord Mayor, uh, and certainly the only one in the City Hall in the Chamber. So that's happening tomorrow appropriately on the anniversary. And your talk is excellent, Liz. Oh, as always. <laughs> oh, she's, she's, she's some woman. She really is. Um, I don't know whether anyone has any questions or comments. I know uh, there's only a few here. And I can credit to Liz again. Uh, I don't know whether. Just to ask, um, where where did they live? Where she where they lived in Clontarf? Um, there's there's a house in Richmond Avenue, which is a controversial. It's a protected structure, but it's it's owned by a certain developer, uh, and it's mired in all kinds of legal action. But the one of the letters mentioned another address, one of our letters, also in Clontarf, I think. But I can't remember which one it was. Do you, do you know the Anything about her addresses? No, um, because she talks about Richmond to one in in Richmond, and then Serpentine. Serpentine was it? That's, is that the or, one? No, um, so it's way back. It was the letter about the letter about Aberdeen. <coughs> Here we go. Yeah, there it's the Seafield. Uh, Seafield yeah. Road, Pontarf. Yeah. Uh, oh no, you know what? That could be another letter underneath. Maybe. Good luck. Can you? Can you? That's her, I'd say that's the address. Yeah, right. yeah. 82. 82. 82. C. C. Hmm. Yeah, something that we have to look into. Find yeah. <laughs> <Another> out. <laughs> <laughs> the more flats to her, the better. Um, and, and even with that, like just the. The, the things that she was sort of speaking out against, like in the Senate, are issues that she was raising. She's on so many boards, like there's a, if, is there a fuel, fuel strike? It's, it's amazing, like stuff that she's doing um, or dealing with in the 40s, we're sort of dealing with today is in the fuel poverty and all of this. Um, she opened up the mansion house so that they could operate from the mansion house um, to distribute the coal and stuff to families. There was another thing that um, a lot of people, couldn't afford to bury their, their loved ones. 
and she spoke out that there should be a municipal graveyard that everyone has the dignity to bury their loved ones. There shouldn't be the cost. That should not be a factor in when you're when you're you're, you're dealing with someone who has who has died. So she's very on point and she's on the ground, like she's really aware of what's going on. And even the whole thing about contraception, um, she was speaking out against the banning of contraception. And not that she may be agreed with, you know, uh, contraception being available, but what she's saying is that there is such a massive problem with unwanted pregnancies and women having all these big, big families. Um, you know, don't ban it outright. To ban it outright is the wrong way to do this. There has to be another way. So she's always aware of what is the real issues for the ordinary people and speaks out and speaks for them. Um, and as I said, like you see in the newspaper, she's getting attacked left, right and centre. And she even says it in her book, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I just feel I cannot, I cannot keep something inside me. If it's, if it's wrong, I have to say it and I don't care about the consequences. And she's just brilliant. I love her. I mm. uh, don't want to trivialise it. Um, uh, brilliant talk, Liz. Um, I didn't read the book until you recommended it to me. But uh, the thing you didn't mention is I love the tea. No matter what's happening, you know, she always says, I make a cup of tea. She's in prison when they raid her house. Every time she says, a cup of tea. So she's a real Irish woman. Oh, I'm really um, forgot about that. That's though. the only thing I wanted to say. You're, you're making us long for a couple of tea. Oh, brilliant. Maybe that's the note to finish the meeting. Mike, Liz, again, two excellent talks tonight. I think you are privileged. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks again. Thank and thanks for everything that came out tonight again. Thanks, folks. <laughs>